because now what you're basically saying is, is that if my plan doesn't work, I have a fallback plan. I have a plan B. And that means that you start thinking about plan B and every thought that you put into plan B, you're taking away now that thought and that energy from plan A. I'm telling you, I've never ever had a plan B. I say I made a full commitment that I'm going to go and be a bodybuilding champion. I made a full commitment that I'm going to be in America. I made a full commitment that I'm going to get into show business and I'm going to be a leading man. No matter what it takes, I will do the work. I will do the work over and over and over until I get it. Wow, encouraging words from uh, Arnold. Arnold. <laughs> I love Arnold. I always think of him as Terminator up there. But um, today, the, the, uh, the message that I'm going to uh, share with you today is titled, No Plan B. And if it could have a subtitle besides the No Plan B, it would be Conviction versus Compromise. That would be the subtitle, Conviction versus Compromise. Now, it's interesting to note that many successful people, Arnold, entertainers, musicians, athletes, they have this same character quality. And that's the ability to make a willful decision, to have the conviction to do whatever it takes uh, to commit themselves fully at whatever task they're choosing to accomplish until they achieve results. And that's a character quality that you can follow when you see someone successful. A Michael Phelps, for instance, you see someone who's completely or was completely focused on becoming a gold medalist, becoming a successful swimmer. He put in the time, he was committed. He had no plan B. Now it's true, oftentimes, uh, many of these people have the wrong motivations for doing what they do. Uh, and sometimes people you know, will, will commit themselves to do certain things because they want fame, they want fortune, you know, and that's the root of what their motivation is and um, you know that's not always good but I believe that we could draw a few parallels with what Arnold's advice was about not having a plan B I believe that uh, it'll apply into the Christian life first and foremost as believers we should have no plan B when it comes to our relationship with God first and foremost and second would be not compromising our beliefs and our convictions, not compromising them, being fully committed to what we believe, to what God says. As you, as you heard him mention, when he made up his goals, number one, he gave himself no other option but to achieve success. And the second one was that he committed himself fully to what he did. And as believers, God asks us the same thing. He wants us to be fully committed to his plan, to his purpose, to his will for our life. He wants us to be fully committed. You know, I fear uh, all too often that we as believers in our Christian lives, we have a plan B in the back of our mind. We have, uh, you know, we're, we're not fully committed a lot of times with, uh, with what we want. We want to serve, we want to experience a little bit of God, but we have these other options. We don't like commitment. We don't like not to have, we like multiple choices. We like multiple choices. You know, I, I was thinking of, you know, in school, like the true or false test or the multiple choice. I like the multiple choice because I feel I have a better, you know, probability of guessing, right? Because I'm like, nah, these are bad, that one. And, then, and I feel that's how we live out our Christian lives sometimes. Not everybody, but we could do that. We, we, we could do that a lot of times. You know, our convictions and beliefs become compromised when we begin to live our relationship with God by having a plan B. Our purpose becomes compromised. We shouldn't live a life having a backup plan with God. God gave everything for us. He had no backup plan. I'm, I'm reminded of, of Jesus right before. He's about to embark being crucified, and he's in the garden praying, and he's asking 
He's asking God, he says, take this cup from me. But not my will, but yours be done. He was completely, he was completely sold out. Jesus had complete conviction in following the plan of God for his life. You know, the Bible is filled with many examples of believers who had strong convictions. It's, it's just filled from beginning to the end. I think of the apostles, for instance. All of the apostles, except for John, were martyred. All of them were martyred for their beliefs because of what they believed in. All of them. I think about Daniel. When they, when they passed the decree and they said, you can't pray to God. And, and what did he do? What did he do? Did he go with the social norm of the time? No, he went back to his prayer closet, actually prayer balcony, <laughs> and everybody saw him despite the consequences. See, having conviction a lot of time, especially in our beliefs, it's not always going to work out, you know, positively. Sometimes it, it may, you know, we may receive suffering because of it. But what does God want us to do? God wants us to endure and push through it. He wants us not to have, he wants us to be fully committed and not have a plan B. Think of also Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. I know Rudy shared that a few weeks ago. And they were like, no, we're not going to worship no idol. If, if that's what you want, throw us in the fire. We'll do it. We'll take it. What conviction. What conviction to face death. But I wanted us to look at the, the definition, Oxford Dictionary. Of what conviction is? What, what, what is it? What is it? Well, a conviction is a strong belief that is not likely to change or a strong feeling that your beliefs are right. You know, the truth is that everyone has convictions about something in life. Everyone has convictions. I'll give you some examples. Some of us have strong beliefs, maybe a few of us, about not eating meat. Maybe we choose to live a vegetarian lifestyle. And there's some people that are hardcore, I'm not going to eat meat. That's my conviction. That's a strong held belief. And they have, you know, they have their reasons for, for doing what they do. Some may have the conviction of eating organic food. I only eat organic. I don't eat GMO. Some, some people have that strong conviction. Some of us may even have strong convictions about the type of brands that we use. I'll give you an example. Apple versus Android. <laughs> some people... I'm not going to say which one I like because <laughs> which one I am, but there's Apple versus Android, Nike versus Adidas. There's some people that all they wear is Nikes. Domino's Pizza, Papa John's, Pepsi Coke. There's some people, you know, they it's a Pepsi, no, nah, I'll pass, you know, I'll pass. <laughs> To bring it closer to home, some of us may have strong convictions about who makes the best croquetas in Miami. Is it La Carreta or is La Canaria? That's a debate for another day. For, for another day, we'll talk about that. And yet some of us have really strong convictions about our political parties or our ideology. So as you see, all of us have strong convictions about, about many different things. The truth is that some of us would never compromise on some of these convictions as trivial as they are. But quite often as believers, we compromise our beliefs and our walk with God. We won't do it between Coke and Pepsi, but when it comes to God, sometimes we, we compromise. And we're all guilty of that, starting up here. This message is for me, <laughs> first and foremost, before everybody else. Because this is something, this is a daily battle that all of us do as believers. We, we need to understand what God says, what do we truly believe, and if I'm going to be obedient or not. And a lot of times it comes to, do we believe God in many of these areas? So let's take a look at the, the uh, definition for compromise. We looked at conviction. So Oxford Dictionary says... A compromise is to lower or weaken standards. So you have your standards. If you compromise, you kind of like lower or weaken your standards. This is not the compromise like in a marriage. You have a disagreement. You work out a compromise. That's a good compromise. That's a biblical compromise. But when it comes to what God says about 
you know, godly principles, how we live our life, what's right and wrong. It's very clear in the Bible. We should have strong beliefs about that if we truly believe that God is who he is and his word is, uh, is infallible. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we, when believers live out their faith with a plan B or compromise, we miss out on the purpose uh, of God's life, God's uh, purpose for our lives. We miss out on it when we compromise our convictions. We miss out on the purpose a lot of times. I'll give you an example. Let's say we had a goal of losing weight, okay, getting in shape so that we can run a marathon. Let's say we, had, we all set that goal, right? Now, in order for us to accomplish this, this goal, we would have to decide uh, to make certain lifestyle changes, right? We'd have to decide to do certain things, certain habits, in order to accomplish this goal. We would need to develop certain convictions in our life if we wanted to eventually run this marathon. Give you an example. We would probably develop a conviction, or hopefully, of eating healthy. If you want to eat healthy, you want to run a marathon, you got to get some good food in you. You also want to exercise. If you're going to run a marathon, you know, you need to, to train yourself up. You need to build yourself up. Another one that you would have to develop would be rest. You'd have to get an adequate amount of rest for you to be able to recuperate so that you're mentally focused. And in addition, we can probably all agree that uh, we would have to be consistent with these lifestyle changes. If we wanted to uh, ultimately achieve our goals of running a marathon, we'd have to not only apply these new lifestyle changes, but then also over a course of time, be consistent. So with that in mind, uh, what would happen if every time, okay, we ran across a donut, we couldn't resist? <laughs> or we only ate a healthy meal, our only healthy meal was breakfast, but the rest of our meals consisted of junk food, okay? Every so often, you know, hey, I'm eating healthy for breakfast, and then I'm eating Cheetos, Snickers, and some fried cheese. <laughs> so, so what do you think would happen if we didn't discipline ourselves to exercise continually? Instead, we frequently came up with excuses for not going out to take a run. What would happen? Oh, my, you know, my ankle kind of hurts. Oh, it rained. It's a little wet. And we came up with these excuses all the time. What, what would happen? What would be the result of that? Now, what do you think would happen if we didn't discipline ourselves to go to bed earlier? We'd be tired. Our bodies couldn't recuperate. We wouldn't have adequate rest. These things would, would affect us. We wouldn't be as effective in achieving our results if that were the case. The reality is that we never truly develop strong, con strong convictions about or beliefs about any of the things required to run a marathon. It will almost be impossible for us to accomplish the goal if we don't commit ourselves, fully commit ourselves, I'm giving you that example, to eating healthy, to training, to resting, you can't expect to run a marathon. That, that goal, that purpose for you is just going to get extended farther on, farther, and you're never really going to truly uh, experience that. You know, this can be especially true when it relates to our convictions and beliefs about God and his word. This is especially true. Uh, we know what God's word says. We know what God expects of our lives. Sorry about that. And, uh, and we compromise. It's almost the, the same thing. We're, we're not getting the necessary things that we need, and we're not doing them. We're not believing God. You know, you see, conviction will get you to the finish line, but compromise will kill your purpose. So conviction will get you to the finish line. Compromise will kill your purpose. Compromise will kill it. You know, if that's the case, God is calling me. So if God is calling me and I have a plan B, you know, in the back of my mind, um, you know, I'm going to have a hard time living a victorious Christian life. If all of us are, if as believers we have these other options, if there's, we have to be in the position where there's no other option but God. And that song that we sang, Jesus at the center of my life, like that literally rings true. Like that, that has to be our focus point. That has to be, we have to be fully committed to God. We have to be fully committed to God. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. Because the Bible says that a just man falls down seven times, but he gets back up seven times. It does not mean we're perfect. The Bible says that there's none that is perfect. None of us. 
Now let's take a, a look at some ways that as believers we compromise our convictions. In James chapter 1, verse 8, it states, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now for the sake of the sermon, we're going to call this double-minded man the plan B guy. This is the plan B guy. Now the plan B guy is probably not sure of what he even believes. Okay, even worse, he's the guy who knows the truth but has weak convictions about God, his word, and his purpose in life. The plan B guy. He still hasn't decided. If you were to do a character profile of the plan B guy, uh, we would find that this is an individual most likely who has a compromised belief system. He's someone who has a compromised belief system. He, he doesn't know right, or he doesn't care, even worse. So how can we as believers uh, compromise our belief systems, our belief system? Well, the first one is we compromise the word of God in order to accommodate society or the popular in vogue view. That's one of the ways that we, we uh, compromise as believers. We question the inerrancy of the word of God. Is God's word true? Is it perfect? Is it inerrant? We begin to question that. We may even begin to believe some liberal theologians, uh, what they believe is that the Bible is a uh, man-made book of moral stories that could be interpreted differently. Now this I want to just on a side note, warning, a lot of times some of the talk shows that you'll watch on TV, some of a talk show in the daytime, a radio program, or a news outlet, they may sometimes bring someone on and they will be like, you know, reverend such and such, and you, you think, wow, this guy has so much, you know, religious clout, and they are preaching things completely contrary to what the Bible says, completely contrary. So you need to be aware of those things, that there is people out there and society in order to accommodate, like these people have made accommodations Liberal theologians will do that. They'll make accommodations for, uh, for moral standards of society. They'll weaken it of what, by, of what God says and some of the views that are very clear. They'll change it around. You know, they believe that the Bible is outdated. It's no longer relevant for modern living. And that the Bible should change with the times and culture. So it should be interpreted differently at different times. It should be interpreted differently. And that, that will give us, that, that as believers is going to get us into a bunch of uh, trouble. Because we begin compromising. We, we see our life starts becoming a mess and then we're questioning, whoa, 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 what is God doing to me? What is God doing to me? And we're in error. We're in error. We're, we're, we're not practicing biblical principles. We're, we're, we're just going with the tide. We're the plan B guy. The plan B guy. Now when we compromise biblical truth, uh, also is another way by allowing circumstances, okay, and our emotions to dictate our beliefs. Sometimes we allow our circumstances and our emotions to dictate our beliefs. Our ob obedience to God becomes conditional. It becomes, uh, you know, I'll serve God if it falls in line with my plan and my purpose of what I want to accomplish in life. That's when I'll be uh, obedient to God. And that's when we compromise our beliefs. Also, when we're, when we're committed to God, as long as it doesn't inconvenience my way of life. You know, the Christian life is, some, it's inconvenient to serve someone. It's inconvenient to put someone above you. It's inconvenient. The Christian life is about serving, about sacrifice. It's about denying yourself. And all those require commitment on our part. It requires conviction on our part. All of those. Now we also compromise our belief systems when we compromise our integrity. Here's a big one. Now some questions that we can ask ourselves, am I a man or a woman of, the, of my word? Do I do what I say? Do I say what I mean? Am I a man or a woman of, of my word? These are questions ask us. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 37, Jesus states, but let your word yes be yes 
or no, we know anything more than this is from the evil one. We need to have conviction. We need to have conviction. We, we, we need to not be double-minded, especially when we're giving our, our, our commitment to someone, our word to someone. Uh, it's a bad testimony as a believer. We all fail, but it's just a bad testimony. Here's another question. Does my life reflect my beliefs? Does my life reflect it? I may say things. You know, if I say that I'm a Christian, do my actions and lifestyle reflect biblical principles? Or am I double-minded or being the plan B guy? Which one is it? Also, am I considered to be faithful and trustworthy? Are you faithful and trustworthy? Are you faithful and trustworthy at your job, with other people? Could they trust you? If not, then uh, we may have a problem here. There may be some type of compromise. There may be some type of compromise. And when we're not trustworthy, it not only affects our integrity of what, how people see us, but it also affects our relationships with everybody when we're not trustworthy. It affects our relationships with everybody. Now, here's another one uh, that we need to ask ourselves. Do I compromise my beliefs and convictions when it comes to sinful habits? Do we excuse sinful habits? You know, some of us keep falling into the same temptations over and over and sin because we fail to form a conviction about sin beforehand. See, that conviction and that belief needs to happen before you get into the situation. Before you get into the situation, you need to determine, you need to fully commit yourself. For instance, I'll give you an example. If you want to be pure until you're married, you need to make that com conviction way before. And it needs to be deep-rooted. It can't be when you start courting or if you decide to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It can't be at that time. You're playing with fire at that time. That conviction, you're going to fall. You need to make that decision beforehand. And that's how we approach sin sometimes. A lot of us, we get in this cycle, and it's just like, oh, whatever, God loves me, I'm not going to blow it. And then our life is a mess. We have all these problems as a result of our decisions because we had no conviction. We had no conviction. Now, we need to make up our minds to sin, again, long before we fall into the trap. Now, a great example of this is found in Genesis chapter 39. And this is a story of Joseph. I know many of us know this story. We've heard it a hundred times. But this time, pay attention. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> You're like, yeah, 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 I know. And sometimes we miss the point because we've heard it so many times. So I'll give you a quick recap. Joseph, Joseph is the son of Jacob and his most beloved son. Joseph had other brothers who became jealous of Joseph and plotted to kill him. And instead, he was thrown into a pit. He was uh, sold off as a slave. To, uh, he was sent to Egypt and sold off as a slave to Potiphar, who was uh, part of Pharaoh's court. He was actually the captain of the guard, and he sold off into, uh, into his household. And uh, we see that uh, God blesses Joseph despite the circumstances. God continues to bless Joseph so much so that Potiphar recognizes this. And here's where we pick up the story in verse 6. Genesis 39, 6. It says, he left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern himself with any, anything except the food he ate. Now, I want to stop right there. Now, do you believe that Joseph was trustworthy? <laughs> Joseph was definitely trustworthy. Like he, Potiphar gave him everything. He put all that he owned. He allowed Joseph to manage it. Let's continue. It says, now Joseph was well built and handsome. After some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, sleep with me. But he refused. Look, he said to his master's wife, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in this house. And he has put all that he owns under my authority. No one in this house is greater than I. He has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how could I do such a great evil and sin against God? Although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her. Now, 
I am almost certain that Joseph had decided beforehand not to sin against God in this area. This wasn't just like, oh, okay. He knew trouble. He spotted it. And he says, I'm not going to compromise my integrity. Look how trustworthy I am. I'm not going to hurt all these people. I'm not going to cause devastation to this family. And number one, God doesn't approve of me doing this. So I believe, I truly believe with all my heart, if you see that, that he had made his decision beforehand not to sin against God. Not only did Joseph not compromise him, his conviction, you know, and refuse to sin against God with Potiphar's wife, he demonstrated, again, faithfulness, loyalty, and most important, integrity. He, and uh, unfortunately, when, uh, when we compromise, we run the risk of becoming the plan B guy. Remember the guy we spoke to, the double-minded guy? When our lives are not lived out with a sense of conviction, we could become the, uh, the plan B guy, the double-minded guy. And this is definitely not, not Joseph. Interesting to note that Joseph then, because of this conviction, he's thrown in jail. It's not something great that happened to him. It wasn't like, hey, you know, fireworks and, and you know, you pass the test. No, because of his belief, he suffered for it. He suffered because of his conviction for doing the right thing. He's thrown in jail. And we know the story. God blesses him there. God blessed his faithfulness. He was, he was committed. He knew his conviction. Again, so other areas where we can compromise our belief system is in our relationships. We can often uh, compromise our relationships with, with other people. Now, this happens when we pursue ungodly relationships, when we allow bad influences to compromise our convictions, when we pursue ungodly relationships. The Apostle Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15.33, he says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. He's throwing no punches there. You know, what's the saying in Spanish? If there's one, tell me, who, tell me uh, who your friends are. That's the one. <laughs> but bad company corrupts good morals. You could be raised here, you know, all your life. You can come to church and you know the truth. And then, you know, you go off to college and, you, you know, you, you, we live in the world. So we're obviously going to have friends that are, some are non-believers, some are believers. But who are you allowing to influence in your life? You know, maybe you want to hang out. Oh, I want to hang out with them. And you keep hanging out with unbelievers and, and they're smoking cigarettes. And you're like, oh, I don't smoke. And then after a year, you're smoking cigarettes and, then they're smoking marijuana, and then after a year and a half, guess what? You keep hanging with them, you're going to be smoking marijuana too. It just happens. We put our guard down, oh, everything's okay. We kind of forget. We put, again, that plan B, ah, God's back there somewhere. He's back there somewhere. You know, I'll serve him one day. You know, we also uh, further compromise our beliefs and our conviction when we seek wrong guidance and counsel. We compromise our convictions. Unfortunately, sometimes believers may listen more to their co-workers' advice than to their own pastors and leaders. You know, as believers, we need to ask ourselves, where am I and who am I seeking advice from? Who are you getting counsel from? Especially when it comes to relationships. Who are you getting counsel from? You know, is it the latest trendy magazine, TV talk show, even movie that you saw? Or is it from people who use the Bible, God's word, as their point of reference for life? Who is it? In Proverbs 12.5, it states, The thoughts of the righteous are just, but guidance from the wicked leads to deceit. Guidance from the wicked leads to deceit. Now someone is going to say, Oh, Ralph, you don't understand my situation. The people at church are too religious. They're too judgmental. They don't understand. You know, they don't understand my, my situation. So my response would be, you know, if you believe that and your relational life is a continual mess, I think it may be time for you to reevaluate who you're listening to. It may be time to reconsider who you're getting your guidance from. You know, things aren't working. 
and not ready. You know, the truth is that some of us may not seek godly advice or godly counsel when it comes to relationships because we know what we're going to hear, we're not going to like to hear. They're going to tell us something that we don't want to hear. That's the reason why a lot of times we don't seek godly counsel. But instead, we feel more comfortable seeking advice from a friend who's not a believer, who's been married five times and tells you, just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. That's the advice we love listening to. We'll be like, yes, she understands me. He understands me, whatever. Follow your heart. That's the worst possible advice that someone can give. <laughs> so Proverbs 27, 6 tells us faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Again, if we hear, we want to listen to what people, you know, nice things and not the truth, it tells us that kisses of the enemy are deceitful. It's, it's not good. And there's, there's other questions as believers that we need to ask, us, ask ourselves in regards to conviction. And uh, the, the first one is really, do we really have strong convictions about trusting God at his word? Do we really believe God at his word? When I read it, am I fully committed? Do I, am I fully convinced that this is true, that he wants the best for me? Do I believe God's promises for my life? All the promises that, that are written in the Bible, do you believe them? Do you have conviction about them? These are the things we need to ask ourselves. You know, do I believe that God is good? That's a big one. You know, we, we may, for whatever reason, doubt God and think he's mean and you know, he, he doesn't want us to have fun and whatever it is. But you know, do you believe that God wants the best for you? In Jeremiah 29, 11, and I know a lot of us know this verse, and this is uh, Jeremiah, God's heart towards the nation of Israel. And this applies. It'll apply to our life also. This is what he says. He says, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God wants to give us a future. He wants to give us a hope. He wants our lives to have meaning and purpose. And unfortunately, when we compromise, <laughs> we, we go off the track. We could save ourselves sometimes a lot of heartache if we beforehand prepare. If, if we mentally we prepare and we're like, man, I'm fully committed to, uh, to serving God. I'm fully committed to doing the right thing. You know, the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 8.28. Here's, here's about God being uh, good. We know that all things work together for good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Now what happens to many believers, is that we begin to believe our circumstances and our emotions a lot of times. We let that dictate over trusting God's promises. And this is exactly what happened to the nation of Israel um, as they were going to uh, take the first time when they, when they went up to the land of Canaan. This is exactly what, what happens. And we're going to take a look. This is a great story, and it's found in uh, Numbers 13. And this is a story of the spies in Canaan. This is a great story. It demonstrates conviction and, unfortunately, some compromise also. Now, to give you some context, the, uh, you know, God does a bunch of through miraculous signs and wonders. Uh, he frees the nation of Israel from Pharaoh and Egypt. Moses then leads the nation through the desert. God continues to perform miracles uh, such as splitting the Red Sea. You know, the, Israel's, the Israelites pass safely through. God subdues the Egyptian army, takes them all out in one fell swoop. God then, uh, after that, continues to lead the nation of Israel with a cloud by day, a pillar of, of uh, a fire by night. So it's a little over a year and a half, roughly, after they leave Egypt. Uh, and God, again, he's performing countless miracles. You can read about this in Exodus and Numbers. I'm giving you the cliff notes on this, so <laughs> forgive me. So he leads them to the doorstep of the promised land, right up to the little year and a half after, after uh, being slaves. And at this point is where we're going to pick up the story in Numbers 13, and I'll start in, uh, in verse 1. It said, the Lord spoke to Moses, send men to scout out the land of Canaan. I am giving to the Israelites. Send one man who is a leader among them from each of their ancestral tribes. Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the Lord's command. All the men were leaders in Israel. 
So we see that a leader is chosen from each of the tribes. Among them, there's Joshua and Caleb. Uh, Joshua is from the tribe of Ephraim, and Caleb is from the tribe of, tribe of Judah, among the, the 12. Let's continue in the verse 17. It says, when Moses sent them to scout out the land of Canaan, he told them, go up this way to the Negev, then go up into the hill country, see what the land is like, and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many, is the land they live in good or bad, are the cities they live in encampments or fortifications, is the land fertile or unproductive, are there trees in it or not, be courageous, bring back some fruit from the land, it was the season for the first ripe grapes. And we continue reading. So we see that, uh, you know, he's giving them their marching orders. The spies go out. So in uh, verse 23, it says, When they came to the valley of Eshkel, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, which was carried on a pole by two men. They also took some pomegranate and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshkel because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut there. And at the end of 40 days, they returned from the scouting out the land. The spies return and be give to give Moses and Aaron a report. Now we see this is definitely a fertile land. It was one cluster of grapes. I can't even think about that. One cluster of grapes. It took two guys to to carry it on a pole. <laughs> it's like this is one here, you know, a lot of grapes. Let's just say the land was very fertile. So here's the report. The men went back to Moses, Aaron, and the entire Israelite community in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back a report for them and the whole community, and they showed them the fruit of the land. They reported to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey, and here is some of its fruit. However, here we get to the point. Whenever you see a however, <laughs> it's usually not good. However, the people living in the land are strong and the cities are large and fortified. We also saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites are living in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live by the sea along the Jordan. Verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, We must go up and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. Is that conviction or what? Is Caleb showing some conviction there? Does he believe who God is? You got to understand this nation has been seeing miracles. Man, man, God is like leading you day and night. He's rescued you. He's done all this. And Caleb didn't even hesitate. He sees everyone there, uh, you know, having a pity party. And he's like, no, we got to take the land. Let's go. He definitely uh, believed God promises and showed some conviction there. Verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him responded, we can't go up against the people because they are stronger than we are. So they gave a negative report. Again, who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? To the Israelites and the land they had scouted. The land we passed through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. We even saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers. We must have seemed the same to them. And in the same passage, we see compromise now. We see compromise now. If you read in Exodus chapter 6, when God is talking to Moses, he tells him that I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to get you out of here, and I'm going to give you the promised land that's flowing with milk and honey. That he Gave him that promise even right before all the plagues and everything happened. The, the nation of Israel knew this. And they kept on doubting. And as you read through the chapters, you'll see you know, they kept on compromising. They kept on compromising and doubting God's word, his promises, his power, his goodness. Let's continue in uh, yeah, chapter 14. It says, then the whole community broke into loud cries. And the people that night and wept that night. All the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron, and the whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us into the land to die by the sword? We see doubt here. We see bitterness. 
disappeared. Our wives and little children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. Wow, these people are throwing a massive pity, pity party. You know, because of their lack of conviction, these ten spies caused all this commotion with their negative report. They caused all this co commotion. It's very interesting that, that they wanted to go back to Egypt. Not only that, they were at the point where they were like, let's pick someone new. Let's pick a new leader. This Moses guy <laughs> who had direct communication with God, they're like, eh, I don't want to listen to him anymore. Again, we don't like listening to the truth because it requires something of us. It requires us to, you know, lay down our own plans, our own perspective on things. We don't like listening to truth sometimes, but he's... And, and, and all of us, you know, that's so like us sometimes. How, how these people are, that's like us. That's like me sometimes. We're like that sometimes. If things don't go our way, we experience a little storm, a little bump in the path. Our first reaction sometimes is just to give up, to look for our own plan B. We start looking for our other plan B. Things aren't going so right. It's not, it's not what I expected. This Christian thing is very hard. We want to turn back on all that we know about God, all that we've experienced with God, and all that God has faithfully taken us through. Each and every one of us, if you're a believer and you've been a believer for any amount of time, you have a story. God has taken you out of Egypt in one way or another. We each have a story. All of us have a story. And we, we forget we start looking for that plan B. We want to be just like the Israelites. We want to go back. Take us back to Egypt. Oh, you know, life was so much easier then. And it's not. It's not. Let's continue reading. It says, Then Moses and Aaron fell down with their faces to the ground in front of the whole assembly of the Israelite community. Let me tell you, Moses was interceding for them at that point. <laughs> he fell down. It was like, God... Save, spare these people because you want to crush them. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of uh, Jephunneh, who were among those who scouted out the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite community, the land we passed through and explored is an extremely good land. Remember God's promise? If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only don't rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land, for we will devour them. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. While the whole community threatened to stone them, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tent of the meeting. Again, when you stand up for your convictions and your beliefs, sometimes you're not going to get a positive result. These guys were fully convinced in God's promises and God's plan for their life, and they were about to get stoned. They <laughs> literally were about to get stoned. These people were, were upset, to say the least. You know, both Joshua and Caleb truly understood who God is. They believed his word. They believed God is good. They believed that he is mighty and powerful enough to have given them victory. You know, I don't know about you, but I want to be more like Joshua and Caleb. Neither Joshua and Caleb had a plan B. Neither of them had a plan B. There was no turning back. Like the song that we sing, that's conviction. There's no turning back. Like we can take the land. God has a purpose for our lives. Now I pray that each and every one of us would become men and women of conviction, just like Joshua and Caleb. You know, as we see in this story, sometimes having a strong conviction, again, is not going to be the easy road. It's not always going to be the easy road. There may be a little you know, some bumps along the road, and there may be some resistance. You know, as a result of the bad report, just to fill you in on the story, God struck down the ten leaders that gave a bad report. He struck them down. And then because of the, their unbelief, God says, you were there 40 days, now you're going to wander the desert for 40 days. And what could have been a short path to the promised land now becomes this long, strenuous 40 years wandering in the desert until... That generation had died except for Caleb and Joshua. They were the only ones of their generation to enter the promised land. Because not until all of them died off did God allow them to enter. And I, and I wonder in each and every one of our lives, when we keep looking back, if we live our Christianity with a plan B, that 
that we're wandering the desert. We're just wandering the desert because you're God's. If you're a believer, you're a child of God, he's not going to just let you uh, go out there. He's going to chastise you. He's going to train you, discipline you, move you. Like why suffer the heartaches? Why? If we could spare ourselves. Um, Again, we run the risk of becoming the plan B guy when our lives are not lived out with a sense of conviction for who God is. Let me repeat that. We run the risk of becoming the plan B guy when our lives are not lived out of a sense of conviction for who God is. Again, conviction gets you to the finish line, but compromise will kill purpose. And with that, let's pray. One more verse, and it's in, uh, just read it from the Bible. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The Apostle Paul encourages the, the church there. And he tells them, therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Be steadfast and immovable. Dear Father, I just want to uh, thank you for... Uh, for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your power, your strength. Thank you for, uh, Lord, your love and your patience with us, God. I pray, Father, that uh, amongst us that you can raise many Joshua and Caleb's, God. Father, that we could be men and women of conviction, Lord, that we can believe you at your word, God, that uh, we can make the difficult choices, Lord, that we can choose truth, Lord, over compromise, that we can develop deep convictions in our lives, Father. In all the areas, God, bring it to us, Lord. Bring it to mind, Lord, this coming week, Father. That you could show us, Lord, where, where we're compromising, Father. And help us, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God. Give us the strength. Now, the reality is that living the Christian life is in, impossible if we're trying to do it ourselves. It's impossible. And you may be here wondering, you know, how I can develop strong convictions and better my belief in God. Well, it first starts out with a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, only through Jesus Christ we're able to live out the Christian life. It's impossible to live out on your own. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all men fall short of the glory of God. That means that everybody has sinned. All of us fall short of God's glory of standards. It also tells us that the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. See, as a result of our disobedience towards God, the result is death and separation from him for all eternity. But the Bible also tells us that eternal life is a free gift of God. And in Romans 5.8, Paul reminds us and he says, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he tells us in Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And my encouragement to you, if, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you know, I pray that you may uh, take that time, that you may cry out to him in your own way and, and tell him to save you. Tell him to give you understanding uh, of his word and, and to put you around other people that uh, will, will show you the truth. So, uh, Father, we thank you again. We thank you, Father. We uh, ask that you uh, bless the rest of our day, God. Bless our uh, time after this, Lord, and Again, we thank you because you're a good God, Lord. You're, you're trustworthy and you're faithful, Father. And Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name.